tonight she will cover Vincent van Gogh, Sunflowers and Starry Nights. One of the most important figures in modern Western art, Vincent van Gogh was considered a failure during his lifetime, suffering through poverty and mental illness. In the decades that followed his death at the age of 37, more and more artists became impressed by his bold colors and brushwork. And he has become regarded as a tragic genius. So thank you so much, Jane O'Neill, for coming online with us tonight. And uh, take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Jess. And good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This should be a really sort of beautiful way to spend the evening. We're sort of transporting ourselves to France and to the Netherlands, and we'll get an inside look at, um, at so many of these really familiar paintings, maybe some paintings by Vincent van Gogh that you've never seen before. I'm going to start off with a very quick shameful plug <laughs> of another program. Um, this is tomorrow night. As many of you know, um, I really love Norman Rockwell. And so uh, my sister-in-law, who is a jazz vocalist and a professor at Berklee College of Music, she is going to lead a sing-along. And then in between songs, we're going to look at Norman Rockwell's images of the season. So it should be really fun. And we're going to donate some of the proceeds to a uh, local charity here called uh, Families in Transitions that's up in, in Manchester, New Hampshire. So if you'd like to join us for that, it is a $10 ticket, but and you can register for it through um, my website, which is IamCulturallyCurious.com. So, all right, back to Vincent, which is why we are all here tonight. I feel like I should start with um, a caveat about pronunciations because I remember being in college, I think, and going to a huge Van Gogh exhibition at the National, National Gallery down in DC and uh, listening to the audio guide and every single scholar that they had on this audio guide pronounced Van Gogh's last name differently. <laughs> and so I think if we were going to be really authentic, it would be something closer to Van Ha. <laughs> but I'm just gonna do it the American way, which is Van Gogh. And I'm also going to refer to his brother as Theo, um, even though that's de definitely um, not how it was pronounced in Europe at the time of his at the time of his life. But I think that's um, more familiar to all of us, and we won't get hopefully hung up on pronunciation. So Van Gogh and Theo, and of course Vincent. So just to give you the lay of the land for today and how we'll move through the material through the next hour, we'll talk a little bit about Van Gogh and his biography. We'll get a sense in terms of what it means to be a post-impressionist and, and some of his artistic influences. We'll look at his early work, which doesn't look anything like the image that we have up on the screen, um, but it's fascinating to know that in the course of a very short, well, a rather short um, artistic career, there, um, one can sort of evolve so quickly. We'll take a look Look at some of his favorite subjects um, and then just uh, different different forms like a still life painting, landscape and portraiture. We'll end with the famous story of the ear because everybody's always interested in that one there and then talk a little bit about his legacy. So let's dive in and think about his biography. So here's another self-portrait of Vincent van Gogh. This one dates to about 1887. So he was a Dutchman and we see he had this uh, rather tragically short life. He, was, he only lived to the age of 37. And he's categorized as a, a post-impressionist painter and we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. And, um, and for an artist who's, who's professional professional career was only about a decade long. He was prolific. He painted about 900 canvases, most of them in just the last few years of his life. And then in addition to that, there's um, more than a thousand works on paper. But he is sort of famous for not being commercially successful. As far as we know, he only sold one painting during his lifetime. This is the painting here. It's called The Red Vineyard from 1888. Definitely not one of his better known paintings. And I would, and I would venture to say not one of 
best either. Um, but like so many young struggling artists, this uh, w- this was a painting that he sold to a friend for about um, 400 francs or about $2,000 in today's money. So um, we always get by with a little help from our friends early on, right? So we get the sense that, uh, that he was not uh, successful as an artist <laughs> during his lifetime. And as, as Jessica mentioned in sort of the uh, opening here, he had uh, he had a, a really really tough life, and that's sort of putting it gently. He lived in poverty uh, at many uh, throughout most of his life, sort of um, almost like a self selected poverty. He didn't have many close friends or romantic relationships in his life, and he suffered from um, severe mental illness. He uh, he did propose to three different women. He was rejected. Uh, it, it was said that his only requited love was his artwork. Uh, he he was known to keep the company of prostitutes. He was seen as a madman throughout his life. He most likely had some sort of manic depression, maybe some epilepsy. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of people that like to go back, experts that like to go back and sort of re-examine his life and his career and um, and even his his mind and and sort of assess it sort of post mortem. But uh, but we know he was probably suffering from a variety of of sexually transmitted diseases too, um, like syphilis and gonorrhea. So that might have had something to do with um, with his mental state. And we know that. Um, that he was probably suffering from from auditory hallucinations, hallucinations, which probably resulted in in um, the mutilation of his ear. So he rarely ate. He drank quite a bit. He smoked probably even more. And we know that over the course of his career, that he regularly ingested paint and sometimes paint thinner. So he was he was a pretty sick man. And of course. Um, his reputation after his death has dramatically um, dramatically changed since, of course, since he was alive. Ironically, in 1890, you know, just before he died, he modestly assessed his artistic legacy at the time as being very secondary of, in, in terms of importance. And of course, now um, his artwork is some of the, the best known and most easily recognized artwork in the world. So he's um, famous, he's influential, and um, and he probably would be astonished at um, at how um, he's regarded in uh, these days. So just a little bit more about his biography. Here is a photograph of his brother Theo, and for many years the painting on the right was considered to be a self-portrait of Vincent, but it's been later assessed to be a portrait of his brother. So the, the, um, they had a, a similar interest in the arts and Theo was really his, his best friend, his closest confidant um, and, and somebody who supported him mentally and financially throughout their lives. They were incredibly close. And we have the record of about 600 letters between the two of them. Vincent never kept any of the letters that he that he received from his brother, but Theo kept every single scrap of paper that Vincent sent him. And these are just um, some of what, uh, uh, an example of what some of those letters looked like. They sort of functioned as sketches. Um, they, they also sort of functioned as a diary. So he was talking about what he was working on, how he felt about what he was working on. They provide incredible insight into who Vincent, uh, into who Vincent was and, and what he was thinking about and how he assessed his own work at the time. Um, so Theo played a huge role in Vincent's life. He even named his own son after Vincent and, uh, and the two were inc- incredibly close. And in fact, I don't think Vincent would have lived as long as he did were it not for um, the love and support of his brother. So just before we move on from um, his biography, I just wanted to give you a glimpse into what Vincent van Gogh actually looked like. This is a photograph of him from 1873. And I think if most people saw the photograph, they would never in a million years imagine that this was Vincent van Gogh because the artist who famously um, painted himself so many times really to me does not look very much like this photograph, but there's only a few sort of authenticated photographs of the artist and this is one of them. 
Um, so he's about 19 years old here. The image on the right is uh, another one of these very well-known, easily recognized uh, paintings by Vincent van Gogh of his bedroom painted in 1889. And I wanted to bring in this image because um, because Vincent, uh, after he, he worked as an art dealer for some time, he uh, became a missionary for, for some time. And he was offered sort of a room to live in and um, as he went out and sort of proselytized. But he, he felt so strongly about the mission and he felt so connected to kind of the working poor that he chose to sleep essentially in the hay of a barn. Like he didn't feel like he should have better accommodations than the people he was proselytizing to. So, um, so what we're looking at here is, is this little bedroom that he had later on in life, but I think it sort of speaks to this kind of monastic lifestyle that Vincent would lead, lead throughout his life and, and how he, um, he sort of preferred simplicity in many ways. Um, and we could get into the artistic elements of this picture too, but, but I think that speaks to that, that part of his life. So switching gears sort of quickly here to post-impressionism and thinking about uh, Vincent van Gogh's uh, influences, just so that we can best understand what we're talking about when we call Vincent van Gogh a post-impressionist and what that means. I'm just going to give you a quick, quick sort of um, introduction to post-impressionism and, and sort of a guide to, to understand it better. So the image that I have on the left is a painting by the impressionist artist Claude Monet. It dates to about 1868. And then post-impressionism um, generally comes about um, 15 to 20 years later. And this is an example of a post-impressionist painting by the art, the French artist Seurat um, from 1888. And, um, and so what you see with impressionism is this kind of loose brushwork. Um, you get the sense that it's, that it's a painting that's been sort of dashed off in the afternoon. And that's what impressionists were really seeking. They were seeking to capture momentary effects of light and shadow. So we see that particularly here on the trunk of the tree. We don't see a lot of um, attention to detail. It's really sort of trying to capture um, the, the spirit, the mood, the lighting in particular in this painting. But when you come to post-impressionism, you have uh, the next generation of artists who were really influenced by impressionism, but they wanted to create uh, they wanted to apply more structure to what the impressionists were doing. So they, so many of them, uh, uh, the the ones that we sort of know best today, uh, created their own rules for impressionism. And for Seurat, that meant a, instead of this kind of loose, freeform brushwork, he would still have this broken vis uh, visible brushstrokes, but instead he would apply each single dot laboriously and very intentionally. And he was particularly concerned with color theory. So you can even see here around the frame of this picture, which he also painted, that he um, would change the color of the frame depending on the color of the paint that was just inside, just next to it inside the the picture so um so color theory will certainly play in with vincent van gogh as well um, paul cezanne is another example of a post-impressionist painter you could easily mistake the image on the left uh, for being an impressionist painting but you can see by the time he gets to the image of the the same mountain on the right um, he's applying a little bit more structure to it he's essentially using these little flat planes of color to describe the the town and even a little bit of that mountainside there so that will later lead into cubism but but you can see he's kind of working through how can i use this this um this language of of the Impressionists in a more disciplined way. And so here's the ultimate <laughs> sort of um, comparison here. We have uh, Claude Monet on the right. This is the artist garden from 1873. And then Van Gogh on, I'm sorry, Monet is on the left and Van Gogh is on the right here with another garden scene from 1888. And so with Monet, we can see again, these sort of quick little brush strokes. Um, and over here, with Vincent van Gogh, we certainly see these broken brush strokes, visible brush strokes, but we see a lot of intentionality here. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that um, the, the uh, 
Vincent van Gogh's sort of signature style here is to change the way he applies paint to canvas depending on what he's painting. So he actually kind of changes up his brush stroke depending on whether it's like part of a path, part of a bush, part of a flower, or part of a roof line here. And you don't really get the same um, sort of bold brush strokes, and you certainly don't get the same bold use of color um, in Monet's work. We see um, generally speaking, the same quality of brushstroke throughout. All right, so that gives us a sense of post-impressionism, hopefully. I just wanted to give you an, a sense of a few other big influences when it comes to Vincent van Gogh. So for the Impressionists and the post-impressionists, one of the major influences for all of, all of them is um, Japanese prints. And right around the end of the 1860s, this huge um, uh, market opened up and all of a sudden France and Europe was sort of flooded with these new images from, from Japan and they kind of galvanized artists of the day. They were really interested in this new pictorial, well, new to them, pictorial style that they saw coming from Japan. So artists, including Monet, who we see over here on the left, uh, were very much inspired by Japanese printmaking and in terms of subject and composition. Many of you have probably seen Madame Monet in a Japanese kimono, which is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And so we can see that Monet was certainly looking at something like the print on the right. And that holds true for Vincent van Gogh even a decade or so later. He was really interested in Japanese printmaking and um, the Japanese pictorial styles. And we know that sometimes, even though he was living that monastic lifestyle, he too, he would kind of surround himself with images um, from Japan. And so this image on the left is a really sort of famous image by Vincent van Gogh. It's these almond blossoms. It was painted in honor of his nephew who was named in honor of him. Um, and the way that they stand out against this, uh, essentially like a flat blue ground is something that uh, is certainly probably borrowed from the Japanese pictorial styles. And so I just brought in an image um, roughly from the same time period to give you a sense of how Japanese artists were creating kind of, um, or using a similar artistic vocabulary in their work. One other major influence that um, you can't ignore when thinking about Vincent van Gogh is that of substances. <laughs> so, so this held true for the Impressionists and for the Post-Impressionists. Uh, the image on the left is an Impressionist painting by um, Edgar Degas, and it's called The Absinthe or the absinthe drinkers. And so right here, this kind of uh, pale green drink over here, which was said to have hallucinogenic effects, was a very strong cocktail that could uh, essentially put the drinker into a drunken stupor. And that's what we see with these figures over here in the Impressionist work. The image on the right is a uh, sort of unusual, I think, uh, portrayal of, of Vincent van Gogh. This is by the artist Toulouse-Lautrec and it dates to 1887. I say it's unusual because it's like a portrait, but I, I feel like van Gogh is turning as far away as possible from, uh, from the artist who, who's portraying him, uh, revealing almost nothing here. But we see him with a glass of absinthe right in front of him. So we, um, so I bring in this picture to remind you that um, that he was, you know, um, ingesting substances that were not good for him <laughs> physically and mentally um, for a, a great deal of of his adult life. And then um, I think that can be sort of reinforced by a picture like this one that he painted called The Night Cafe, which dates to 1888. And we're so lucky because it's here in America. It's um, down in Connecticut at Yale. And, um, and here again, you sort of get the sense of, of people kind of hanging out after midnight. We've got the clock in this cafe over here, hunched over their drinks in a place that looks um, a little bit foreboding, I would say. We'll look at this picture a little bit more in depth later on. But this gives you the sense of, of where um, Vincent van Gogh was spending some of his time and, and what um, his fellow um, drinkers might have been my time. So let's dive into what his early work looked like, because with everything, with every artist, um, some of the early work, even though it, um, it might look very different from, from where the later work goes, it, we, we oftentimes see 
um, the seed of, of what blossoms later on. So this is a painting that he created in 1885, and it's an open Bible with an extinguished candle and a novel. It's also called Still Life with Bible. And this was a Bible that belonged to Van Gogh's father, uh, uh, who was a Protestant minister. And of course, I, you know, the overwhelming impression here is a very sort of dark and serious picture. And so um, it's art historians sort of think of this as, um, as Van Gogh kind of setting up for us this idea that he and his father had kind of differing worldviews because, um, the text in the foreground is Emile Zola's Joie de Vivre next to it. So it's sort of his father's way of looking at the world and Van Gogh's way of looking at the world. Um, so, but, but I think visually we see some interesting things happening here. It looks like this table is sort of an inconsistent line in the background. It's an overwhelmingly um, dark still life painting. And, um, and we get the sense of, of um, kind of an artist who might be interested in more in tradition than in innovation this early on. So we do know that he um, he worked as as essentially a minister. He was very interested in um, in peasants in, in Belgium and in France, and he would uh, essentially document them in a lot of his paintings. So these are works from the early 80, 1880s as well. And they kind of show people at, um, at difficult or even low points in their life. The, the image on the left is called At Eternity's Gate. And I think it's such a powerful portrayal of, of sorrow and despair. Um, the way uh, the, this male figure sort of holds his head in, in these kind of fists. And, um, and Vincent van Gogh specifically gave this work an English title because um, what he wanted to reinforce was this idea that, um, that faith was really wedded to, um, or faith in God is really wedded to uh, a, a sense of eternity here. So, um, so even when he was painting somebody who was at this kind of desperate moment, um, his his, uh, his personal faith still sort of played into um, his understanding of these circumstances. And so, without a doubt, Van Gogh's early masterwork is this one here, and. Um, don't feel, don't feel bad if you've never seen it before, and don't feel bad if, if this picture does not do much for you. I will admit that it does not do much for me, but it, it is, it's an interesting uh, work to look at considering where we know he goes. So this is called The Potato Eaters. It's from 1885. It's dark. It's dreary, <laughs> um, but this is a work that Vincent van Gogh was very proud of. He wanted us to see um, peasants, or he wanted to depict peasants the way they really were. He, um, he deliberately chose uh, people who uh, were sort of coarse and who were kind of considered ugly to be his models, uh, and he didn't want anything to be... Um, uh, sort of sugar-coated. So he wanted to show these people uh, sort of gathered around this very humble table, eating this very humble meal. And, and in this humility, we see um, sort of this closer connection to, to God and to their faith and to this kind of unspoiled life. So, um, so, and, and you might even notice there's there's a religious painting up here in the upper left where we can see a prominent cross. And so, of course, art historians love to connect the potato eaters to one of the other uh, famous meals uh, from, from art history that also has a great deal of religious significance here. So, um, so, so I think this early masterwork is really kind of coded with a lot of um, religious language, but, but I think in terms of, of Vincent van Gogh's um, style and, and visual interest here, we see most importantly, a real interest in, in a simple subject matter, a humble subject matter. And I think that's what takes us into our next section here, which is peasants, farmers, and work. So this was a topic that really preoccupied Vincent van Gogh for much of his career. And I wanted to kind of give you a sense in terms of what this looks like. Um, 
we think about what what some of the other artists from of his age are painting. They're painting, you know, beautiful landscapes. They they might be painting um, portraits of the, of the rich and famous. And Vincent Van Gogh was um, really committed to showing kind of work and labor, and and um, and in some ways making that work and labor seem kind of heroic. If we look at these works here, they're um, they're they're framed in such a way to to give some some stature to to the subject. So the image on the left was painted by a French artist named Millet, who was painting right around mid century, right around the 1850s. And he was a realist artist. He was also really committed to painting farmers and laborers and peasants, and um, and he was a source of great inspiration to Vincent Van Gogh. Van Gogh would actually get um, black and white reproductions of Millet's work and then go from there. He would sort of use the same composition and then reinterpret it with um, what seems like a much more wild color palette um, when, when you see the two of the, the works together. But here we have kind of an anonymous laborer doing sort of God's work here, um, striding forward, looking very powerful and um, and, and Van Gogh is in every way quoting this, this earlier artist, but we can see he's using these signature brushstrokes and we begin to see this real interest in, in color theory. And that is of course, taking the traditional color wheel and, um, and selecting two colors that are opposite each other on the wheel. So oftentimes we'll see like yellows and purples or yellows and blues or greens and reds, that sort of thing. Um, so that they they sort of pop visually and and maybe even sort of um, kind of vibrate in our eyes in such a way that that make these colors kind of stand out in in a really sort of powerful and expressive way. So we have dignified work here. Um, and we have this subject of the sower coming up again and again in, um, in Van Gogh's work here. And again, we see color theory at play, this, this kind of orangey yellow and the lavender field here. Again, that, um, that kind of dignified farmer striding forward, still sowing seeds here. By the end of his career, he's painted the same subject, uh, um, I think 30 different times. And, and this is, so of course, this isn't the first time we see a big celebrity celestial event happening in one of his pictures. And then another sower over here, we've got this uh, strong silhouette of this tree here, which might remind you of a Japanese print, the silhouette of the sower, uh, who sort of uh, got this halo that's been created by the setting sun here. But our colors are really wild. We've got the purple in the fields, a little bit of red, a little bit of green, and all of these colors are selected because of the way that they relate to each other. Generally speaking, that's, um, that's one of the things that's really driving uh, Van Gogh's color choices. One more sewer for you to see. Some of them are really are much more striking than the others. Uh, but to give you a sense in terms of how closely he was following Millet's work, this is um, Millet's probably his masterwork. If you took an art history 101 class, you might remember seeing this painting. It dates to about 1850 and it's called the Gleaners. These are the people that go in uh, after a field has been harvested and they're just essentially picking up the scraps. So the Gleaners are really really kind of the poorest of the poor doing this backbreaking work. And, and that's really what, what Van Gogh begins to focus on so much in, in the mid eight, in the early and mid 1880s before his color palette just sort of brightens up. It's people hunched over, it's people where you get sort of sympathy back pain just looking at these pictures. So you can see here, there, he painted uh, people um, in, in scenes, in poses of labor, uh, and I shouldn't say poses because he was probably out just documenting them. I wouldn't imagine that these people were posing um, or modeling. They were at work. These are all peasant women um, digging up potatoes here. And then to end on a slightly happier note here, <laughs> um, one last picture by Millet that was a source of inspiration for Van Gogh is this uh, picture called First Steps. Millet's original is from 1858. Van Gogh's reinterpretation of it is from the year he died, 1890. And so it's a scene of a young peasant family where the father has uh, dropped his tools 
to uh, open his arms to his young child who's taking the first steps. And Van Gogh has animated it with, with these kind of curly cue brush strokes uh, throughout the, the, um, the trees and the greenery in the background. And, and it's just framing it with, um, I, I don't know, all of this kind of positive energy, I would say. So our next category here for understanding Van Gogh and, and the way he approached painting is still life painting and in particular flowers. And of course, we all know that Van Gogh loved to paint flowers. I wanna give you a little bit of, of context for, for um, still life painting, particularly if you're Dutch, <laughs> which of course Van Gogh was. So, um, so the Dutch have an incredibly strong tradition in terms of still life painting. And these are two historical still life paintings from Dutch artists. And I think the, the first thing you might notice when you look at this is a high degree of realism, a high degree of detail, um, symbolic meaning, and very dark background. So, um, so this, is, this is the strong tradition coming from, from Van Gogh's homeland. And I wanted to give you a sense that in some ways, early on in his career, Van Gogh is kind of interested in the, this um, in this tradition, the image on the right is a painting from 1884, and it's just called Still Life with Clogs and Pots. So he's using um, he's using simple, uh, uh, simple subjects, but he's kind of uh, still using that kind of dark palette. And you almost get the sense that he's arranging these objects with this history in mind, but he's certainly not as interested in capturing all the minute detail that um, sort of the forefathers of Dutch art were interested in. And to be honest, I'm not sure if, if Vincent van Gogh was ever capable of creating an image like the one that we see on the left. But his, um, but his fluid um, sort of beautiful brushstrokes are, are visible over here on the right, particularly I love the shine on those bases. And I think as Van Gogh's palette kind of lightens up, his work gets even more interested. interesting. So if we compare it to a historical Dutch uh, floral still life, like the one that we see here from the 1700s, by, um, by the mid-1880s, we see Van Gogh kind of coming alive with the subject of flowers and he worked um he he liked to paint flowers particularly because they were um cheaper than paying a model <laughs> so he could go out buy some flowers pick some flowers and all of a sudden he gets the opportunity to explore form and color in a whole new way and of course he's not doing it um with the with the same detail that that comes from the dutch tradition but in some ways he's sort of following the tradition um, in terms of, of just flowers as, as a subject. And his arrangements are pretty traditional. So, um, so what happens in, in, um, in Van Gogh's life is right around the mid 1880s, he goes and he moves in with his brother, um, providing a, a source of stability, uh, emotional and financial that he had not had for, uh, for quite some time. And, um, and, and they're living in a city center and, and all of a sudden Van Gogh has the opportunity to sort of rub elbows with other artists and look at how his painting begin to change. All of a sudden they're bright. They're sort of filled with this vitality. They're kind of filled with this, with this, um, with this promise of good things to come. So this is Vase with Hollyhocks from 1886 on the left and then on the right, vase with red gladioli from um, 1886 as well. And in these floral still lifes, um, from right around this time, we begin to see these this interest in um, the broken brush strokes, sort of giving these paintings a little bit more structure, particularly you can see it in the background of these paintings. Um, here he's almost creating this kind of cross hatching structure in the background and even on the surface of the table. Um, and, and he's exploring um, even the structure of these flowers in just sort of interesting ways. And the colors, again, are, are just coming alive in, in such a beautiful way. So he's experimenting, he's, he's kind of finding his path, and then you get to the sunflowers. And I don't know how you feel when you look at this, but I think ju just sort of seeing that progression here, there's something like that I can palpably feel in my body where it's like, Yes, 
it's he's found it he's like landed on a solution here and it's so satisfying and rewarding as a viewer to see these works particularly knowing how he progressed to this point so van gogh sort of falls in love with the sunflowers um, to him they express gratitude of course uh, these the yellow flower is such a happy flower he paints this um, series of sunflowers uh I, I think somewhere between nine and eleven oh 12 in total different sunflowers and he and he wrote to his brother i think the sunflower is mine. He really sort of identifies with this. And so what makes these images so satisfying to look at? I think in part because he kind of animates every single petal here. They seem to have a life of their own. They seem like they could kind of crawl right out of these vases and just kind of go away <laughs> or crawl away, almost spider-like. Um, so, so he really, he brings the subject alive in a, in a remarkable way. He's still kind of playing with color theory here with um, this kind of orangey yellow and this, uh, in particular with the painting in the center, this bright blue background. But, um, but we can see that he has stumbled upon or arrived at something that is really working. The other thing to consider is that, um, he is benefiting from, from the fact that that in terms of paint colors, this was sort of a new paint. This particular hue was kind of a, a new uh, color that was on on the scene for our, for artists to use. So this was a fortunate uh, 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 selection of, of a subject matter in terms of, of the color possibilities. Here is a painting of Van Gogh painting sunflowers. And so we can sort of get a sense of what the artist looked like when he was at work. We can see the brush in his hand. This would be the, um, the canvas that he's working on. And this would be, you know, essentially how close he sat to his subject. The artist here is um, his friend, his sometimes friend, Paul Gauguin. This was painted in 1888. Well, a little bit more about his relationship with Gauguin as this goes on. But um, apparently Van Gogh did not like this portrayal. And, and he said, Gauguin, you made me look like a madman here. <laughs> so just to speed up a little bit more, we see some really sort of beautiful still life paintings from um, the last few years of his life. These are irises. This was painted in 1890. Again, these colors, they just kind of um, come alive because they we have that color theory working. Um, this kind of uh, bluish lavender color is at the opposite side of the color wheel from the golden colors in the background. And again, I, I talked before about the sunflowers looking like they could get out and crawl away. We have irises sort of escaping from this vase here, but he paints every petal with um, and, and gives them such distinct character that there's something really sort of gorgeous here. This picture in particular, it's called Roses. Um, uh, it, the colors have sort of faded here. These roses would have been more pink when they were painted, so we would have had that color theory working. And um, and since this was also painted in the last year of his life, this was this was actually considered a very hopeful painting that he had created. Um, I believe it was uh, just before he he left from the uh, asylum where he had been staying for about a year. I love the background here. It sort of looks like this windswept um, space. And, um, and then you get this incredible kind of overwhelming base of, of roses in the foreground. All right, so, um, oh, I should mention that this is also in America. This is at the National Gallery of Art in DC. It's such a gorgeous painting. So, um, so I also wanted to quickly go over still lifes with you, or I'm sorry, landscapes, because of course, Van Gogh is so well known for his landscapes. And again, I do think that um, the Dutch traditions sort of come into play here. We talked a little bit about the influence of Japanese printmaking, but here is an image. This is actually from my hometown museum up here in, in Manchester. This is a historical Dutch painting uh, from up, uh, about the 1600s. And, um, and what we see here is a, a tree that's sort of silhouetted and a path leading into the distance towards a little town. Uh, and, and it's sort of like this dead or dying tree over here that would have had some uh, religious significance at the time. And, um, and then we see Van Gogh sort of doing something similar with this 
dead dying tree uh, silhouetted against the sky and a path leading us back to these buildings in the distance. So he was probably really familiar with Dutch traditions in terms of, of landscape painting, but certainly the Impressionists made um, a, were, were hugely influential on him as well. So the image on the left is painted by the Impressionist artist Sisley, dates to 1878. I love putting these two pictures together because it almost looks like the Spence sort of continues from one picture to the next. But with Sisley's painting, we get the freedom of those brush strokes. We get the sense that um, that that you're you know you have a momentary impression of being out on this wheat field on a windy summer day and. Um, and there's a, there's a looseness and, and uh, a freedom to it. And then we move over to Vince Van Gogh's painting from 1888 and we see it's all structure. Um, every single brushstroke is very intentional in its direction. Um, all of the color choices are very intentional as well. Um, the, the mountains here in particular sort of playing off of the greens and golds in, um, in the foreground and the middle ground. So, um, so we have that, uh, that structure that Van Gogh loves so much. And, and these pictures are also really just stunning in terms of, um, of the labor involved with them, but also the color choices. This is another beautiful garden scene that he painted in 1888. And we've got this beautiful path that leads us into the middle distance here. And I just love these little red brush strokes that sort of, um, they almost function like little footsteps leading our eye back. But I think that this is another great example to show you how he changes up his brush strokes depending on what he's painting. If it's a rock wall in the distance, if it's these red flowers in the foreground. And again, his color choice here is always just so gorgeous. I feel like we've got our those irises right here in the center of this picture. And just one more um, landscape painting that I couldn't resist showing you. This is uh, also from 1888. It's called Peach Trees in Blossom. And the colors are just so beautiful. It's a breathtaking picture. And, um, and so we see that he's really kind of come across his, uh, he's found his own style and his own system for, or his own structure to impose on Impressionism, to create um, images that have a real sort of impact. They speak to um, the, the natural world, but they also kind of speak to, um, I think our, 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 our souls in some way, just because I think the, the brushstrokes and the color choices are so expressive. Now, before we leave uh, landscapes, I do want to connect his work back to that French artist Millet one more time, the artist who is working right around 1850. And in addition to the subject choice of the sowers and, and um, farmers and peasants, Millet created some really interesting scenes um, that are set at nighttime with interesting celestial things happening as well. This huge moon hovering in the picture on the right. This uh, sort of looks like a double or a double rainbow happening in this dark sky in the picture on the left. Um, so these are kind of stunning paintings, I would say, for the time. You don't often see too many um, night scenes like this, particularly with um, uh, such a, a, a stunning effects happening in the sky. And so we know in the 18, in the late 1880s, uh, Van Gogh became really um, determined to paint uh, nocturne scenes, these evening scenes where he imagined that the stars would sort of light up the sky and, um, and, and would play across a dark blue sky in the same way that flowers would play across um, a hay field. And they would just be these bright pops of color. So if we look at both of these scenes in totality together, we can see that Van Gogh is really playing with color theory. Once again, he's interested in, in, in juxtaposing the blues and, and the yellows here. And in doing so, he has created these scenes that, I mean, probably everyone here tonight has probably had a calendar or a postcard or something with one of these two scenes on them because um, 
they they just resonate. We see you know these little uh, uh, characters kind of walking by the water here. There's something deeply romantic about these scenes as well, probably because they're evening scenes. We've all kind of imagined that we've sat out on this uh, cafe terrace there. There's um, there's a warmth to that scene in particular, um, and and there's something about these twinkling star stars that I think speaks to the romantic in all of us. But then we have this, <laughs> and once again, you probably, if you're anything like me, you have a palpable reaction to this picture, particularly when you see it in terms of his progress as a landscape painter. So this is, of course, Starry Night from 1889, and we can see here, when I look at this, I just think everything inside Vincent van Gogh has sort of clicked, come together to, to create an image like this, which is just so incredibly satisfying to look at. So, um, so of course, I, this is one of the most recognizable images from um, Western art. I remember um, when my son was in preschool, he came home and he was telling me about this picture. So I, I think to a certain degree, everybody's really familiar with this picture and loves this picture. Um, what's not to love? The colors here are gorgeous. We, we know now that, of course, color theory is at play with the choice of this blue sky and, um, and the illuminating um, uh, yellows and whites in the sky as well. We have this really sort of interesting swirl of what is potentially clouds or atmosphere at the center of this picture, almost forming a knot right here at the center. We have all of these um, stars and then the moon over here, uh, which have these halos to them with these little dashes of paint all around it which uh, all together has this effect of, of um, creating almost this pulsing feeling when you look at this. I've, I've shown, I've brought this image to, um, to groups of seniors and um, retirement communities. And I often hear from them that they can't even look at this, that, that, that this picture sort of pulses to them uh, in, in such a powerful way. And this is of course the view that, that um, that Vincent van Gogh had from his room in an asylum in, um, in the final year of his life. It's an invented view. We know he, he created many studies of this view. We know he, he invented the town that's here, but the town plays, um, or I mean, he, that town isn't, it wasn't in his particular view, but the, the town did exist. And, um, and the town plays such an important role here because the spire of that church sort of unites the sky and the landscape here. And that's kind of echoed in, in the shape of this large framing cypress tree over on the left. So there's all these kind of um, rolling elements in here that have such a, uh, a wonderful sort of effect in terms of this 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 movement this motion um, in this scene and um, and this is another picture where people with with a certain set of expertise go back and they apply their knowledge to to what was happening uh, um, in terms of. Of, of astronomy at the time. And we do know that the moon wasn't right for the time that it was painted. So, so we know things like this is an invented image. Um, and, and it wasn't uh, it necessarily the way uh, Vincent van Gogh was, was, um, was seeing the world. I do, I, I, I do remember that he wrote to his brother that he wasn't really satisfied with this pa painting and he called it, I think he referred to it as being a study. So, um, so I just wanted to show you a few lesser known works that I think relate really well to Starry Night too. And they are all painted from the last year of his life. Um, we have this, this kind of interesting moon hanging in the sky. We have a, another um, perhaps a star or, or sun with a halo around it. I love this picture over here on the left. It's called Couple Walking Among the Olive Trees with the Crescent Moon. The colors here are just beautiful. I love the peach up against um, this sort of turquoise in the sky. But the figure here in the foreground, I can't help but notice that, um, that it's a man with uh, an orange beard. And so you sort of wonder if, um, if, if Vincent van Gogh was sort of romanticizing about or fantasizing about what his life could sort of be like at this time. And then some of his, uh, his, of his late 
landscape paintings have this really sort of dark, powerful um, sky to them. This is one of my absolute favorite paintings by him because this church that he painted, this is from 1890 as well, the, the last year of his life. And this is at the Musée d'Orsay. This church, I always just felt like could come alive like a spider and just kind of walk away. And that there's something so dark and so foreboding about the color of the sky and even the brush strokes that kind of animate that sky as well. It's a really, really striking picture to me. It, it sends shivers down my spine, in fact. Um, and then this, this picture here called Wheatfield with Crows. I know people have a, a really visceral reaction to this picture as, as well. This is one of the, the last landscapes that he painted. It's from 1890. And we get the sense that, um, that, that again, we have this dark sky here and that the wind has just come through and shaken up all this wheat and that the crows have just risen up here. We have um, a, a variety of paths we can sort of imagine moving down. Um, uh, none of them sort of uh, more inviting than the next, but um, but we but this is a picture where the brushstrokes are huge, they're bold, they're very visible, and we get the sense of all the gesture and and the power that sort of went into creating something like this. So um, so like I said, this this is this is another one that that tends to evoke um, a very strong reaction in the viewer. All right, so um, you can't talk about Van Gogh without talking about portraits. And I know we're running a little bit short on time, so I'll move through this sort of quickly. Some of his earliest portraits of, of peasants were, um, were I, sort of in their own way kind of modern masterpieces. I think he was really interested in these bonnets that the, that the peasant women were wearing. But again, he was kind of seeking out um, um, uh, non-traditionally uh, non-traditionally beautiful people <laughs> and um, and focusing on you know the asymmetry of their faces in in really sort of um, a, a loose kind of modern style but we do see here from um, this series of paintings of of a, a of a man who owned an art supply store his name was Pere Tanguay we see beginning on the left that that Van Gogh uh, had mastered uh, a, a roughly naturalistic style. We, uh, it's still sort of loose brush, brush strokes, visible brush strokes over here. And as we progress through time, we see Van Gogh, um, Van Gogh's brush, or I'm sorry, color choices getting m much more bold and his brush strokes getting even more bold as well to the point where you see like you feel like you can see almost every thread in the in the jacket and in the pants and we also see that this um, art supplies uh, uh, or art store owner uh, is also surrounded by these Japanese prints that that um, that we know Van Gogh loved so much. So Van Gogh would go back to the same subject many times. And I think you could probably make the case that he did so because he didn't know too many people. <laughs> he didn't have many close friends. So this is the wife of his friend, the postmaster. Obviously he went back and repainted this picture several times. And, and again, this picture is all about uh, color theory as well, the greens and, and this, um, orange in the background. This is a, a picture that's that's referred to as La Bercuse because um, this is a woman who is rocking a cradle. That's what this rope is in her hand here. Uh, I would say that these aren't necessarily the most flattering uh, paintings I've ever seen, particularly uh, with these kind of uh, pale green, pale yellow complexions over here. There's something sort of sinister about, about them, but um, but these are, are really sort of stunning compositions and, and stunning in terms of, of the color choice as well. And I think he loves this sort of uh, flat pattern background as well. All right, so moving through, let's get to a few other. Oh, these are, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Dr. Gachet in a little bit, in a little bit but these are portraits, uh, a, a first and second version of, uh, of a portrait of Van Gogh's, um, doctor before he passed away. So this was somebody who was helping him with his mental illness. And we can see this sort of classic melancholy expression from the doctor here, who's got a uh, foxglove in the foreground in, in his hand on the right. And, and foxglove um, 
there was a, a, a drug that was used to, to treat mental illness that was derived from foxgloves. So it's probably why it was uh, selected there. But the pose, the expression on the face is really meant to speak to the fact that Dr. Gachet was also a very melancholy figure. And Vincent Van Gogh wrote to his brother that he sort of felt like at first it was the blind leading the blind. He was sort of like, how is this doctor supposed to help me at all? Uh, Van Gogh, like uh, other Dutch artists like Rembrandt, uh, 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 subscribed to the grand tradition of extensive self-portraits. <laughs> so we can see here an early self-portrait with the pipe and the red uh, goatee or beard, and that uh, and and that red hair certainly becomes a signature for him. And over time, we see Vincent Van Gogh um, portraying himself, showing himself to the world through uh, what is kind of a transformation in his style and in his physical being. So in this work here, he's showing himself as an artist. This is from 1887. This is when he was in Paris. He's doing pretty well. Um, there's a fullness to his face that we see sort of similar to that photograph that we saw before. Uh, his brush strokes are, are vivid and animated here, but there's a realism to this picture as well. As we move on through time, his brush strokes get even bolder, his color choices get even bolder. Uh, these self-portraits almost make it look as though he's wearing war paint. I just love these pictures. They are absolutely wild. And, um, and then uh, I, I love the way he's even painted his clothes, the background here. There's just so much energy and vitality to these pictures and really bold choices in terms of color because I mean, look at this. There's like streaks of green across the face here, but it's it's all about color color theory, and I love the cross hatching of, of, of these brush strokes uh, across his nose. So he's experimenting, and he's showing us um, these experiments across um, his own his own face, uh, his own identity here, and then a dramatic change. We move from those very strong brush strokes to um, this sort of flat, austere background. This is a picture that's at um, the, the Fog Museum down in Cambridge at Harvard. And here he's presenting himself as this almost skeletal being. Uh, the fullness of that face that we saw before is gone. And now we've got um, this kind of uh, gaunt, uh, 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 look to him, and um, and and art historians even talk about how he's almost changed his his identity here to kind of identify with those Japanese prints that he saw and loved so much. He's kind of setting himself against that flat background in the same way that we saw with the almond branches before. Uh, you'll notice that there's some text across the top of this picture that has been painted out. We'll talk about that momentarily and get back to it. But just uh, some of his last few self-portraits, of course, include the bandaged ear after um, the famous ear inc incident that we'll also be talking about. And then as we get towards the end of his life, I think you sort of begin to see um, the, um, the, the mental illness sort of taking hold here as well. Um, this looks like a dramatically different person than this. Um, he's really gaunt here. His, um, even his nose looks sort of like beaky and skinny. He looks like somebody who has, um, who has really transformed. And of course, at this point, we're looking at a painting from 1889. It's that dark blues. It's the dark blues. It's the blacks. Um, and these are the same colors that we saw in those night sky scenes that we, that we just looked at in the, in the landscape section. All right. So, um, one more, one, oh, just one or two more. Um, here, the, the background is all swirling, sort of like the sky from um, Starry Night. This is a self-portrait from, um, that's a, at the Musée d'Orsay. And even though the colors are so bright, his face looks so restrained. He looks really uncomfortable here, like he's wearing an ill-fitting suit. And then one of the very last uh, self-portraits that we have here, um, he's shaved his beard. I think he's even showing us that um, he's cut his face as he's shaved his beard. So from one picture to the next, I think it's really hard to say, um, to identify him um, as the same person from one picture to the next. We almost get the sense that he's trying on different identities or that he's changing his, his whole appearance and himself according to how he's painting. Um, 
but uh, these are dramatic experimentations in, in terms of, of um, his style and his color choices. So let's finish up with the story of the ear and the aftermath, because the aftermath too, and um, the story of his death has, um, has been um, sort of called into question, I would say in the past decade or so. So, um, so the story of the ear really begins with um, Van Gogh's relationship with another artist named Paul Gauguin. I'd mentioned him before, they were very good friends. And, um, and Van Gogh invited Gauguin to come and live with him and so that they could paint together. And, um, and, and I think he sort of even envisioned, you know, a greater kind of artist colony. That, uh, that could rise up around this. So these were self-portraits that they painted for each of themselves for each other and exchanged as gifts. So this would have been an inscription to Gauguin across the top of this picture. And you can sort of see here, Gauguin has sort of painted himself in this kind of sinister. And, and I think there's something about the way he's painted himself that um, to me, I've always kind of imagined him as, as this villain right or wrong. So um, they had a, a, a very sort of uh, <laughs> contentious relationship and, and, and living together in this house kind of uh, created a great deal of friction between them. So one night after they quarreled, um, that was the night that Van Gogh's ear was um, was mutilated, and I say mutilated because the legend is is that it was cut off. But there's, I, as far as I know, there's no true documentation as to whether or not the entire ear was severed, or if it was just an earlobe, or, um, or or some other you know small part of his ear. We don't we don't fully know that, um, and what we do know is that he um, he took that that whatever was severed and he went to uh, a prostitute and and essentially said keep this <laughs> and um and had a, you know a night where he essentially was found in a ditch and <laughs> and and close to death uh and and that night Gauguin got on a train and left town so we even have um the the local newspaper account of, of what happened there and um and this was right around christmas um, in 1888. So we're coming up on like the 130 something anniversary of this. So, um, so interestingly enough, um, everybody always assumes that, that it was, that it was Van Gogh who did this to himself. There is a theory that, um, that Gauguin, who was a master fencer, he, um, he had experience with swords that he might have done something to Van Gogh. And Van Gogh, when he was found, essentially said uh, something like, I have done this to, I've done this to myself. Don't, don't find anybody else because it was me who did this. So it was sort of this idea that he was taking the blame. He didn't want his friend to get in trouble potentially. And then we have all of these um, uh, fantastic, interesting pictures of, of, of Van Gogh uh, with the bandaged ear. And, um, and like I said, we don't really know what the result of that mutilation was and, and really who, who committed it. So we have um, these images here where we have the green and the red and the orange. And Van Gogh specifically wrote to his brother about that color combination when he was creating that work night cafe. And he talked about the combination of these colors as potentially driving someone mad or inspiring them to commit a crime. He talked about um, th that they were so bright and so garish uh, against each other that they had a really strong impact. And I think, you know, after he, um, he was involved in, in that incident to show himself using those colors, I think speaks volumes. So uh, within a few months, he was staying at, he was staying, he was um, at a, a, an institution, a, an asylum, and, um, and he lived there for about a year. And these are depictions of that asylum. It was only about half full when he was living there. So he sort of had the place to himself in many ways. He would go outside and paint on plein air. Um, he had a, you know, a bedroom upstairs and a studio downstairs. And so he had a fair amount of freedom. But when he first got there, that is when he painted the irises, which is a, a, another one of his most beloved works. And this is at the, the Getty out in California. And he talked about um, having to continue painting this work, which again, he sort of thought of as a study, but he thought 
he thought of it as a lightning rod for his illness. And he felt like if he could just keep painting it, he would, um, he would stay sane. So art played such an important role in his mental health. So we do know, of course, um, he, he, he dies tragically at the age of 37 in 1890. And, um, and, and he has always thought to have been a suicide up until um, about the past decade when two Pulitzer Prize writers sort of add into a 900 page book that they wrote about Vincent Van Gogh in a little appendix that maybe this could have been a murder because we do know that um, in, the, in the small town outside of Paris where Van Gogh was living at the time, there were a group of teenage boys who essentially um, pulled pranks on him and and hung around with him, but kind of bullied him and tortured him, even though he was the, the adult and they were teen, the teens. One of them liked to dress up as a cowboy. He had a little gun that would misfire quite a bit. And so the thought was that he may have accidentally shot Vincent van Gogh instead of Van Gogh shooting himself um, because he was shot in the abdomen. He walked a mile back to his room and it took him 29 hours to die. So it doesn't seem like the most efficient way to kill oneself, although there were plenty of things that were that he supposedly said uh, upon his deathbed that might indicate that um, that he had done this to himself. He did actually say, you know, I've done this, don't look for anybody else, but it could have been like what happened with Gauguin where he was maybe deflecting, uh, trying to protect someone else um, because certainly he was battling mental illness. And, and so potentially he could have thought, you know, somebody else has done this, but but this is this is the chance to, to end the suffering. And so he uh, supposedly said to his doctor, you know, don't heal me because then I'll have to do this again. As he was dying, he said to his brother, something to the effect of, you know, will this suffering ever end? Uh, we do know that a gun was found in the field where he was thought to have been shot. And that gun was just auctioned off last year. Uh, and it went for $182,000, even though it's not proven to be the gun that killed him, it was thought to be. Um, and so Dr. Gachet, his doctor was one of two doctors that went to his room and tried to help him over the course of, um, of his suffering before he died. And Dr. Gachet was an artist himself and he actually portrayed Vincent Van Gogh on his deathbed. So this is actually the closest we get to, to seeing, as far as I understand, the closest we get to seeing that mutilated ear. And, um, and this is uh, what Vincent van Gogh looked like as he was lying there in his bed. We do know that he went through uh, periods where he could, you know, sort of sit up and smoke while he was, um, um, after he had been shot before his death, but he also was experiencing a great deal of pain too. So Dr. Gachet captured him here and, um, and Dr. Gachet said, um, at Vincent Van Gogh's funeral just a few days later, that he was, that Van Gogh was an honest man and a great artist who had only two aims, art and humanity, um, which is such a, a good reminder and a good way to finish up. Van Gogh's little brother, Theodore, Theo, um, died just six months after Vincent Van Gogh and his new wife and their young son are really credited with um, taking care of Vincent's artwork and establishing his mm -hmm. legacy as an artist and ultimately establishing the museum where, um, where uh, the, a great deal of Van Gogh's artwork still exists. So if we think about Van Gogh and popular culture, I mean, everybody's heard his name. There's so many different products with, um, with his images attached to them and, and they're sort of ubiquitous and they're familiar and they're still so lovely. I think people with sort of any level of experience with the art world are still really drawn to these images for some reason. And then sadly, there's still um, a lot of people that don't think about, or a lot of products being made that don't think about or speak to um, Van Gogh's own humanity. And there's a lot of jokes out there about the ear and the mutilation there. Um, it goes on and on and on. I can't believe how many products are out there that kind of joke about that. Um, it's a strange thing. But we do know that he is one of the most beloved artists that, um, 
that there ever was really. So in terms of uh, museum visitorship, his museum, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, is one of the top 30 visited museums in the world. And out of those 30 museums, that is the only museum that's dedicated to a single artist. And the image of the postman that we see over here on, um, on the right, that sold for $123 million. It was purchased by MoMA. Um, about a hundred years after the death of the artist. And um, in grand total, I, I believe that um, just, I, I think nine of, of his most recent paintings that have sold have um, added up to about $900 million over the past decade or so. So, um, so there's this, um, this kind of never waning <laughs> interest and, and love for his work. And I think um, part of it is the allure of that, that tragic artist, you know, the artist that wasn't successful at all during his life, but, um, but his reputation sort of blows up after, after his passing. And then now even with the continuing mystery and ambiguity in terms of what happened with, um, with Gauguin and then what happened with his death, uh, the controversy there, I think um, there, the interest in Van Gogh will live on for years to come. But I have to say, just going through this presentation over the course of the past year or so, I, I think I've definitely come to, into the camp where I think he might have been murdered. It may not have been a suicide. So it's just something for everybody to chew on and, and throw out at, uh, during, during conversation with family and loved ones over the next few days. So I will wrap up there and I welcome any questions or comments anybody might have about Van Gogh or anything we've talked about tonight. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jane. That was wonderful. We've had a bunch of um, really positive comments about your presentation, as usual. Um, and thank you again for coming online with us. We do have some questions. Um, I, my first question, though, we had a pastel painting workshop just the other day where they were covering. He was uh, teaching everyone to do a Georgia O'Keeffe painting, and he kept mentioning the speed at which Van Gogh would produce his paintings relative to other artists. And I think it was something like, not, he, he averaged something like a painting every four days. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't know if you actually talked about that, but can you tell us a little bit about how that might be possible or what that does for his process or how that, where does he get the supplies that yeah. quickly? <laughs> you know, those are really, really good logistical questions. <laughs> and I think, um, I, I mean, I always, I, I go back to his brother being a benefactor mm -hmm. and I think he's really only working at that speed in the last year or so of his life. Okay. Um, it's really from 1888 to 1890 that he becomes so prolific. And, and I think you could, you could extrapolate a lot from that. I mean, that's what, probably when his mental illness was most severe. And I think that um, you could probably make the case that, that creating artwork sort of helped to ease that in some ways or provided a distraction or it channeled it or it was, like he said, a lightning rod for, for the mental illness. So... Um, so I also think that, you know, the, the more you paint and the more, um, well, it's also, it's like practicing anything else. It's like you get better and better. And so mm -hmm. you can see sort of like he was um, like flexing those muscles and he was, and he was getting better and better. I think, you know, towards the end of his life, when you see those things like Starry Night and the sunflowers and you see, you know, the things, every, everything is sort of coming together in this really sort of tight and satisfying way, you can see that that all of that, um, that practice has really been paying off. But mm -hmm. those are excellent questions about process. And then also, you know, the logistics of the finances too. And then knowing that he painted 900 paintings mm -hmm. over the course of his life, I still don't quite know where they all were when he died, mm -hmm. how, how his brother's wife was able to hold on to so many of them and then help to um, promote him so well. After after he died, and keep so many of them for the for the museum as well. So so there's there's a, a few good logistical threads that um, that I should pick up there, or if anybody wants to delve into that over the next few days. 
<laughs> and then I also am very intrigued by the background. Um, he never uses the traditional background. He uses something very fanciful to, and yeah. do they all have some significance to the subject of the painting? Oh, oh, like in the postman here. Yeah, yeah. Or the there's a there's another one a few, I think some slides back, maybe. Yeah. Um, I think that might have been a wallpaper that mm -hmm. I think we saw. Oh, he, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the in the depiction of his wife, too. But um, but it's been abstracted out here too. And it's interesting that he chose it because um, I mean, he certainly could have painted a flat back, uh, flat colored background here. But it, I mean, we get these kind of swirling tendrils, which, you know, would remind anybody of, of Starry Night here as well. And even the way the beard sort of curls, we get that same sort of effect. So, I mean, everything's a choice, everything's a construction, and it's always fun to kind of uh, speculate as to, as to why he made the choices he did. Um, Mary asks, uh, where did he live in France? Oh, Mary, you're going to test my um, my <laughs> knowledge of geography and also my horrible French pronunciations. Um, <laughs> um, he was in Arles, Arles, France, um, when uh, when when he was living with Gauguin and the incident with the ear took place and he was in Auvergne. Um, when, uh, at the end of his life, he, I believe he lived in Paris with his brother right around the 18, the mid 1880s. And then he, um, spent some time in Belgium too, before that. Mm -hmm. So he moved around a fair amount. Um, how much of his work was done in the asylum? And is there a difference in style? We saw the difference in the irises a little bit. Yeah, I would say um, I did have that statistic right handy before in my notes, but um, offhand, I would say he was, that's where he was extremely productive there. Like I said, he had a studio on the first floor of the asylum. And I would say um, some, of, some of his best work was, was painted there. Some of those later um, still life, those floral still lifes that we saw, were painted at the asylum, including the irises in a vase and those pink roses. Mm -hmm. so, um, but again, it's also just mm. a point in his life and it, at his career where he had been practicing and kind of flexing his muscles. So, um, so he had gotten to a, a really great point in terms of, of, of his talents and his skills. But I, I think, I'll, I'll, and of course, Starry Night was painted while he was there. So I, I think it's, it's safe to say some of his best work was, was done at that asylum. And I think that there was a sense of safety, certainly while he was there, but, but we also know over the course of that year, he had um, several relapses, which um, were, um, you know, uh, severe and, and painful for him. So it wasn't just, you know, a steady sort of upward tra trajectory. I think like for many people with, with severe mental illness, it was a little bit of a roller coaster. <sighs> such a tragedy for, I mean, it's such a message for how we treat people with mental illness, really. Um, and I know I've seen him, I actually have seen him in the Musée d'Orsay and it's, it's such an amazing experience when you come face to face with these oh, paintings, but um, is there a large collection elsewhere? Um, where in the States is there a large collection? Yeah. Um, I mentioned Night Cafe is down at Yale, and we saw um, one of those self-portraits, the one with the, uh, that flat sort of jade green background, that's at, at, um, at Harvard. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I think there's probably like one or two, there's probably like one strong painting in most major museum collections in the U.S., um, so I'm thinking like the Met or Brooklyn or, or the MFA um, and maybe a few like uh, less significant works or works on paper, but it seems like the bulk of them are, are still in um, the Netherlands at, at, the, at the Van Gogh Museum. Okay. And then, let's see. Is it typical, for, this, is a, this is kind of an interesting question actually, 
Um, is it typical for an artist to paint so many self portraits? Yeah, it's um, as far as I know, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> sort of moving quickly during that part, but I did bring in that that portrait of of um, Rembrandt, who painted about sixty self portraits over the course of his life, and of course he lived much longer than Van Gogh, but yeah. it's pretty unusual um, for an artist to paint so many self portraits, and you know, and then in the twentieth century you have somebody like Frida Kahlo. Um, who is kind of limited in subject matter <laughs> as well, <laughs> but is also kind of interested in portraying uh, emotional pain, physical and emotional pain in the same way. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting that, that, yeah, I mean, for the most part, you don't have uh, the, the subject of the self just coming to the front and center so, so much in, in an artist's body of work. And, and I think for the simple reason that like, who would be, if, if you're sort of an unknown artist, who would be interested in buying it, right? And particularly in, in Van Gogh's case where he, he was, you know, thought to be sort of a madman. And, be, and you know, I, I mean, he was being bullied by teenagers. He's not necessarily, it's not necessarily the face of, of, the, of the, fa the face of someone that you want hanging in your living room. So, um, so I think he did it probably for his own, well, certainly for his own reasons. Um, but, uh, but we can see, you know, all of his interests and experimentation sort of playing out in those self portraits too. Yeah, it's, um, it's so different from how we are now where we're constantly taking selfies and <laughs> creating art out of ourselves. Um, it's interesting. Um, and then Debbie asks, uh, how did he learn about color theory and did he take art classes? Mm. I, should, I should know that better. I, I know that he um, was working as like an art dealer with his brother or for a company that was like an art dealer um, very early on. So I offhand, I, I don't know where he received his artistic training, but I don't think don't quote me on this. I don't think he had much formal training as an artist, but he certainly had an interest and he had uh, early exposure to the arts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was the period of his asylum visit? Uh, that would be right before the end of his life. So he was there, the incident with the ear took place right around Christmas in 1888. And then essentially for most of the year 1889 and then into 1890 is when he was at the asylum. And then he died in the middle of the summer in 1890. Okay. Yeah, so he was under Dr. Gachet's care for just a couple months before he died. Great. Okay, Jane, I think that's all we have for you tonight. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your time and attention tonight. Um, I did get a message that there is a, let me just read this real quick. Um, let's see. Okay, the, I do want to encourage everyone to check in with the Chelmsford Art Society if you are interested at all in art locally. Um, it's chelmsfordartsociety.org, chelmsfordartsociety.org, and they are a big fan of this series, so please check in with them. And yeah, that's it. Everybody had such a wonderful time tonight, Jane. Thank you so much sure. for your time. And um, again, our, the next program with Jane O'Neill is on January 26th at 7 p.m. And it's gonna be Andy Warhol's 15 minutes of fame. So it's gonna be a really great calendar year for, for art this year. So please join us and register on our calendar. Thank you so much. And happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye Thank now. You.